Last week, we took a bit of a dive into a pretty crazy world of open source intelligence, and some of the ways anyone can start to put together a picture of you with nothing but some clever search tricks. It was an interesting look at how just by living your life normally, someone might be able to creep into the cracks of your web presence to get a good look at who you are. And we talked about how there are people called skip tracers, who do that as a career. They'll make it their job to find people evading their responsibilities, or even the law. Well, I'm taking what's normally my week off to give you a look inside the life of a skip tracer. I know him as Tank, and you've probably heard about me talk about his show, Cyber Sector 7. So this week, I'm going to pass the reins, and instead of telling the story, I'll be asking the questions, and letting Tank explain what in a shell a skip tracer is. All right, so back to the first question. Do you prefer Tank for this, or do we uh, want to go by a different alias? Uh, Tank or Kyle Reese, whatever you prefer. I'm going to preface this for the people who are going to be listening on my side. If you haven't listened to Cyber Sector 7, there is a bit of a tradition on his podcast at the start where he cracks open a drink. So in solidarity, what I'm going to do right now... Give me one second, I'll go grab a drink. Absolutely. So what I've got today is a black cherry seltzer. And I have a Fago orange. So I guess let's get this started with just the basics. Now, in my research, I found skip tracers have different job titles depending on whether or not you're corporate, depending on whether or not you are a individual doing specifically contracts. Can you talk to me a little bit about what you feel the best definition of a skip tracer is compared to maybe some of the more corporate jobs? Yeah. I, um, so with a skip tracer, what you're essentially hired to do is just use whatever resources you have at your disposal, uh, to find people. And it's usually people that either are owing debts or, um, you'll see a lot of times, uh, missing persons, but it's usually very people centered. It's not, asset centered and there there are two types of skip tracers and uh there's real estate skip tracers and then there are which i don't consider that an actual skip tracer and i don't know where they got the name from but then there are actual skip tracers that are finding people who have skipped and you're tracking them down it comes from the word track so skip tracer where they have skipped town or skipped out on rent or whatever it may be and um when you tell people you're a skip tracer, it's actually really rare that they know what you're talking about. And when they do, they ask, oh, so you, you track down assets for real estate investors. And like, no, not that kind of skip tracer. I had a discussion with a couple of people in my field about this the other day, and a couple of them even had to be like, oh, I had to look up what a skip tracer was. It's not common knowledge. And I think it's kind of funny that with skip tracers, uh, with pen testers too even, you go back to all these stories of like, you know, even back to a prohibition, like all this stuff kind of evolved, I feel like, from bounty hunters, from lock pickers, from con men, and now they're all taking over cyber intelligence. Yeah, it's it's crazy, you know, because you, you have to learn a very interesting set of skills is how I kind of see it. And you can either go to jail with those skills or you can use it for good. And there's not a whole lot to use it for good other than cyber operations. So Right, even that didn't come around really for the cyber side of it until the last 15, 20 years, I feel like. So how did you get into skip tracing then? Did you start freelance? Was it just like you found something online? Well, the first time I ever heard the term was reading a book by Frank Ahern. It was uh, How to Disappear. It's a fantastic book, and um, I read it, and he was an ex-skip tracer, and now he's a privacy advocate and helps people disappear. But um, that's the first time I'd ever heard it, and I got kind of interested in it, and I was, I was already pretty interested in the OSINT side of things at the time. And so uh, I started just using my skills to, to do however I can and finding people, and the only people I really had to find were missing people, or um, like most state most wanted lists and things like that. So I just turn them in and uh, look for them, turn them in, and then through Crime Stoppers, wait on a cash reward. And, you know, that's really hit or miss if you even get the reward. And then my wife talked me into applying for a job, and I got the job. So going back to tracking people down for Crime Stoppers, can you talk to me a little bit about who was the most interesting person that you can talk about, or at least in vague terms, describe the situation that you've kind of had so far for tracking down? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm not going to give any names away here for my own protection and, of course, for their protection because I haven't kept up with their lives after they got busted. Um, and I, I don't want to be sued, of course. So, But I, I have had some very recent ones actually come up that were really good. There was a this week, actually, I was finding a UFC fighter, and his his daughter was tragically murdered a couple years ago, and he had went missing, and his wife had went missing, and they were being sued for just a abnormal amount of money, so uh, the company I'm with was contracted to try to find him, and so me and my team, we got together, and we just started looking for him, and they kind of moved on to other things, because the case got really interesting, but um, this, this story kind of ties in with what I've been talking about with my show and privacy as it turns out the UFC fighter is a huge privacy advocate and I was able to talk to him on the phone a little bit and when I had pulled his some of his reports or some of the databases we used the, ever since the incident with his daughter uh, he started registering like 20 and 30 new addresses just one hitters and it just kind of freaked me out I was like where is he actually at and so, so that, that kind of was one of those stories where you get to talk to someone famous and you get to find somebody that was actually trying to go out of their way to hide so and the only way i ended up did finding him was through breach data i pulled his wife's phone number and called his wife so that breach data in particular kind of harps back to what my last episode was a little bit about where we were talking about publicly available information right and how simple it can be like if you can't track down someone you can also find someone close to them just a google search away from finding breach data something like that where it's either a phone number or email address or point of contact and people might not think that when they get these emails from companies saying, oh, you are part of a breach, that it'll come back to them. But this is kind of an instance where it did come back to them. They were cleaning up their breaches and changing their phone numbers consistently. And when they see it in a breach or, or just really cleaning up their passwords and their emails and their online space, I would have had a much easier time finding them. And it, it goes back to someone, something someone told me. It's always, you know, the partner in your life that will give you away. And in his instance, you know, he was trying to hide. He was trying to stay and keep a low profile. But it was his wife's last of care that gave him away now i think that's an interesting point that it's always the partner in the life because i can kind of see that where it's not necessarily because they don't care it's that we are educated on the problem and in this country i feel like in particular there's not enough education on the problem growing up especially since the early 2000s since this has really started to become more widespread with people just having phones at a younger age you don't get the education and there still isn't a good program but for us where we are actually understanding and sometimes taking part in what's going on we have a first-hand look and by definition a person who's next to you who unless they are in the same field won't have that same understanding and it's harder to teach right off the bat so i can see where the partner is coming back to bite you in the butt a little bit metaphorically there and that's that's actually I know we we talked a little bit before we started recording and um and I said I had been found out one time by somebody and they found out who I really was and it was my partner that had given me away and they had connected me to them and was able to figure out who I really was and then it was also on top of that my dad had a whole bunch of old Facebook posts and it was like I was perfectly fine i i had done my due diligence but it was the other people in my life that didn't do their due diligence and that's how I was found. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit because for my listeners, Hank has a series on privacy. And for me, I try to take privacy a little seriously in my life. I wouldn't say I'm the most privacy conscious, but I'm also aware of what I should be doing. Part of me for a long time has considered myself kind of a privacy nihilist. I've got, you know, I have so many people in my life that I can only be so safe and there's also a picture of me that can be pretty well painted based around those people. Curious, like, how? what would you say to someone like that where it's like, I don't know if it's worth the effort because of the picture that can be painted of me from someone else? Yeah, you know, that's... I've, I've had to try to convince people like that, and my father in particular, who just doesn't care about privacy at all, and he doesn't see the point, and I, I had to throw him a few bullet points, one of, one of which being, so... I understand I'm not going to be able to convince you, but what if there's someone in your life that does have something to hide? Or, for instance, in the case of the, the case I was talking about earlier, um, you know, what if 
his wife, the UFC fighter's wife, was able to realize that there's people in her life that do need to stay private. And if she would have took it seriously, he wouldn't have been found. So if it's about protecting the people in your life rather than just yourself. If you don't care, you know, you don't give a rat's behind, that's fine. But there are people in your life that do. And you do need to take them seriously and respect their, their beliefs. And you can kind of see it, I feel like, with a UFC fighter, there's a certain level of celebrity there, right? And the for them, the application here is they don't want random fans just showing up at their front door or calling them out of the blue because that's going to get old real quick. For the kind of down-to-earth person on our level where you said, oh, maybe someone in our life has something to hide, you know, it's not malicious, but, you know, it can be something as simple as you might have a family member that hasn't come out yet, or you might have someone who's preparing to do a big purchase or who's preparing to leave for a new position and those kind of secrets if they got out they could do harm depending on who your family is who you work with and things like that so there are repercussions for small breaches small pictures that can be painted from the people in your life and it it can be really hard to convince people of that but you know sometimes you just have to tell them if you're not going to take it seriously i understand i'm not asking you to take it completely seriously but i am asking you to respect other people and by doing that you know that's even with convincing people to take photos offline because like that stuff stays up forever it can be really hard to convince people to take a picture of you offline until they realize that hey you know there are things in my life i don't want the world knowing and you're putting that at danger it almost feels like you have to separate at some point the person you were from a person you are because you can only go so far and i know if i tried to get every picture of me online removed There are going to be some people who on there who are like, I haven't talked to you in years. Why are you asking me this? And or they might not even be friends with me on Facebook anymore. Right. Like there might be pictures that I don't know of me online because I might not be contacted or connected to this person anymore. But they might still have those pictures somewhere and they're still in my bubble somewhere. Yeah. And I'll I'll tell you if if. If I were to be contracted to come looking for you, the first person I usually or the first group of people I start to look for is not you when it comes to social media. If, if I have your real name, I, I may go ahead and pull your account up and I'll put it on the side. What I'm going to do is go ahead and look at your family and I'm going to look at your contacts and who you're connected with and your associates. Because a lot of times we find that when we post something psychologically, we're like, well, I don't want to give too much information away about myself. I I don't want anything to come back to me, so I'm just not going to add this. But your family members, if it's not them, they usually don't care. And I've really found that is a very frequent event where, especially like during the holidays, where family members will just post and post and post and post and post. And you'll go one holiday in, in the holiday season, and you have a complete painted picture of where everyone's living at, where everyone's staying at, um, what part of town they're in. You, You can pull a full profile just off social media and just sitting there in the corner lurking and watching so it's a silent even in hacking right it's always the silent part of a network that you want to pay attention to all someone needs to do is sniff they need to just watch sooner or later something interesting is going to come across their desk or come across their console and they'll have what they need a lot of the time you don't need to go so far as to actually contacting the person or trying to get into the system eventually the information can come to you if you're patient enough And and I will say this to anybody that's listening or maybe aspiring to be a skip tracer in this field. um, Be careful what you do sniff. Be careful what you do take and and never take more than you need. Um, Because when you're looking for people and you end up going down a rabbit hole and like, well, I have the information I need, but I'm just going to dig a little deeper. You will find oftentimes that you've dug too deep and you've opened up a can of worms that you cannot close again. Yeah, I have to imagine, Bear. In this line of field, there are some interesting ethical considerations with stuff like this. Like, you are only supposed to go so far as to find them, but you might accidentally trip over into something else that now you have to report as well. That that happened with a case uh, right closer to when I started the job I have now. Um, it It was a simple case, and it was just a woman who owed a few thousand dollars on her car. And, you know, it, I took it because it... it seemed like I could do it fast and easy and it would take no time at all to to complete so I pulled some reports on her and I just started digging and I found her address was was correlating with another email address and breach data and then I started matching things up and I found an alias through just breach data and so I was like okay well I should probably stop here you know I, I have 
where she's staying at. Um, but I kept digging and I kept digging and I uncovered a CP ring and that still haunts me today. Um, and what it's even more haunting about that, I guess, is that she was a teacher at a local high school. So what's, what's the boundary? Should I have stopped or should I have kept going? For anyone who was unaware, CP is a child pornography ring. This is something that is seriously, I feel like, above our heads here. And in this kind of situation, the only thing you can do is report it up and hope that you've made a difference here. Well, she, she ended up going to jail about a week later after i had made my full report to the local police i i didn't i decided not to go through crime stoppers or anything like that i needed that taken care of like asap and and it, the site was eventually taken down but it's it's one of those things where if you are in the field and you got a weak stomach or you have a very guilty conscience don't dig too deep only take what you need have you ever not been able to find someone how often does something like that happen it, it happens every every now and then, and it's because we have some clients that we, we – so I'll start one skip trace on, let's say, right now. I'll start the skip trace. I don't find anything, or I'm, I need to wait on some more information, or I'm waiting to pull some documents from the county clerk or, or whatever they, that may be. So I put it a month out, and that's – and our workplace, we call that – uh, st2 which is skip trace 2 um and so a month later i'll come back to it and see make sure i have all the proper information and look back into it try to find them if i still can't find them i move it to what's called st3 and then after that uh i either with some clients if i can't find them on three months in then they just cancel the job and then refile it in the courts if it's a court job and that's usually the only times i can't find them um because if it's a court job, they'll just refile and refile until they get it. And usually it's someone who's gone out of their way to hide. And I've told them, like, look, you're not going to find this person. They're 80 years old, never owned a cell phone, never paid taxes, and they're living with family and couch surfing. You're not. I just leave the case alone. Some people, especially I feel like on that upper limit of age here, they just didn't put their foot in the technology water. So having that kind of digital footprint is non-existent. In your course of skip tracing, is it safe to say that if some of these people had tried even just a little bit harder, you would have had more trouble finding them? Or is it fairly cut and dry for someone on your end to just catch them in their attempts to maybe obfuscate where they are or what they're doing? If half of the people that I, I go after would just try a little bit harder or just use their brain when they make a Facebook post, um, then it would it would really throw me for a, a a roller coaster ride you know it but the, the sad truth is 95 percent of the population doesn't care and so it makes my job easy even of that 95 percent <laughs> maybe 20 percent think that they can tell facebook not to share your information by copying and pasting a facebook post have you ever seen one of those come around where i don't give facebook permission to use my information or whatever yeah, those, those drive me crazy, and uh, it's, it's funny because a lot of the information from Facebook is sold and to uh, a lot of data brokers, and in our line of work, we have access to a lot of data broker reports, and so we can build a quick profile on somebody with that, and I'll see, I've will see i seen it sometimes on the people I'm looking for. They'll have posted that, and I'll have their information on my screen while I'm looking at their Facebook, and I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> When you're talking about purchasing this stuff, from what I was talking about largely in my last episode was open source intelligence, but there is a little bit of a almost pay-to-win style too, where because Facebook and these companies will sell information on you for ads, they're not necessarily selling them to ad companies, they're selling them to people like you were talking about, the data aggregators, and those data aggregators are selling that data to mostly ad companies, but also instances like what you're talking about, a skip tracer who will go and look for you and maybe try to paint this picture of who you are, not necessarily to try to sell you something, but to figure out what kind of patterns you have and where you are. There, there was an instance recently kind of like that where there was a case, and I, I can't remember the name, but uh, the person, according to all her family, is a, a privacy advocate, and I'd even, even, even called some of her family members looking for her, um, and it wasn't a, a bad case. They just needed to contact her and give her some things. She was an heir to something. Um, so I've been trying to find her and trying to find her, and she was super, super hard to find. And 
through one of these data broker sites, they had bought data from a streaming service, and that streaming service was had her email on it and her and the IP address she last connected with, which happened to be at a college all the way across the United States at a whole different corner of the world, it seemed like. And so I just called the college and asked, hey, you know, um, you have a student and I've been trying to get in contact with her. If there's any way you could have her call me. And she ended up calling me and she was like, how did you get my information? I, you know, I've been trying to hide and really push to try to hide. And I'm like, well, you signed up on a streaming service with your college on insecure Wi-Fi and they sold your data. So let's let's walk through this in terms of a public person right now. We'll say my own family member, right? They use Netflix, and now Netflix has sold their data. Three weeks later, they're either getting mail or they're getting spam calls because in this situation, because Netflix sold their data, including the IP address of where they were in, they were able to put together a bigger picture, say, okay, now we're going to tie this to other information we have bought from other sources. Here's his cell phone. Uh, number we're going to call them trying to get them onto whatever kind of marketing plan we're trying to put them in and we're going to start sending them mail we're going to start kind of attacking everything we can to get them into wherever we want for our next big product movement it's small things like this when you wonder why i'm getting spam calls all the time or why i'm getting mail when i didn't really request anything that it all kind of can come back to you might have just been living your life and someone sold you and you know i even talked to her about it she said, you know, she always uses a VPN, and the only time she didn't, as she knew she'd probably had messed up, was when she signed up with her, her new school email on at that school, which already had her information, and it was just one streaming service that they give you a discount on at the school, and she's like, that's how I know 100% that they sold my data. I'm like, yep, that's the only logical explanation. I wouldn't have been able to find you if they didn't sell your data. And it sounds like she's doing something similar to what you've talked about before, which is making sure she knows where she can be tracked back to, right? She was able to figure out it was the streaming service a little bit because that's the only place she uses it. You've talked about in your show mainly putting certain names to certain services. So if you ever get compromised and they spell your name a certain way, you can really hammer it back to, oh, well, it's right here. This was where V breach was this is where i need to put a little bit of effort into disappearing and changing it up a bit it kind of sounds like she was aware on that sense but this was just an unfortunate turn of events yeah and you know it only takes one time that's all it takes it just takes one little mishap and then if anybody is looking for you you've messed up so it's it's a constant every day every time you sign up for anything online or even connect to your wi-fi and that's probably even why this phone call may be a little choppy is because i'm routing everything over a vpn so it might even be a little choppy so let's shift gears a little bit out of the skip tracing and maybe into a little bit more onto what you've recently been highlighting which is the privacy series for a little bit of a refresher can you want to talk us through the series that you've been doing on your podcast about privacy I've been, I started a series and, you know, I don't usually do a lot of series on the show and I decided to try something a little new, but on privacy and I'd already talked about why you should take it seriously. I already made a whole episode about that. So I didn't want to beat a dead horse there, but I did want to talk about steps you can take to become more private and the process of doing that and learning how data shifts around and learning how to track your data and take your data down and leave false trails. I think what a lot of people skip is they, they take their data down and you know they may delete their Facebook or their Twitter or something like that but they don't think about the data that's already out there on them they don't think about there's 80 million people search sites all scraping data from 80 million other people search sites and sharing your information and then on top of that they don't know where it's coming from or or they're just taking it down and not figuring out well they're scraping it from this point and that data broker got it from this point so this is where i need to take it down or change it and then leave a false trail so if anybody does come looking for me they're going to go look in boondock middle of nowhere and if you had to take one tip from the series that you've kind of put on for someone who's just starting out and just trying to get into privacy, what's like the first step you would give them? I would tell them if you're really trying to learn how to do it, go take out a piece of paper and a pen, write down a, maybe five or six different aliases and just ha 
just have fun with it. Go sign up for 20 or 30 different accounts online. Wait a little while and just watch it pop up. Just start learning how to search it, dork it, and, and pull that information. And since you have it all written down, you've held onto that piece of paper, watch where all that information pops up and then watch what kind of targeted advertising you get and then pull your information. With a lot of stuff, you can opt to, to see your information of what they've collected on you. So just see it and then that that will usually scare people into it. And they're just like, yeah, I did not know they knew that about me. And it's when you say, like, I did not know they knew that about me, you can kind of see what's being sold if you're just starting out as well. If you go to Facebook within their settings, you can go in and there's two things that you can do that I would encourage anyone listening to this podcast to do. The first is you can actually download your profile, right? You can download it as a zip file and it's every picture, it's every post, it's every comment, it's every message. Even ones that you thought you had deleted, they were not actually gone. Your information when you delete it doesn't necessarily mean that the service provider is deleting it. They're still keeping it on the back end. And you kind of brought up the point too. It's like if you delete your account, everything that's already out there is still out there. It's not going to automatically delete all the breach data, right? So you can go and download your profile, see what's there. And you can go in and see what apps are tracking data and what apps are selling data for Facebook. So you can get a look at, you know, people have had Facebook now coming up on, if you're an early adopter of it, almost, uh, God, it's got to be almost 20 years. It's Uh, just about 20 years. It's probably about, what, 16, 15 years? Yeah, the back half of the second decade. And, you know, those people just starting out were mainly college and high school kids. So there were all these apps that we were just giving permission to that still have your permission. They're just not at the forefront of your Facebook page anymore. So those companies, they're still taking data from you. They're still aggregating it and they're still selling it. Yeah, it's, and you know, even people now, they try to, to, to delete their information. And I tell them, I say, well, have you ever went to the site, have I been sucked? And they're like, well, no, what is that? And I was like, well, in 2019, there was a giant breach and it compromised millions of Facebook records. So you can go ahead and delete it now, but I can go to have, have I been sucked, plug your information in. And if it pops anything up, I know that you were in that breach. So I can go check that breach on one of these numerous hard drives and know, see all of your information that was there. And it was a lot of information. It was a, it was a hack that even I used a long time ago and somebody finally ended up scraping it and then it turned into a major breach. I think a lot of people don't really understand. Like when we talk about scraping stuff, a lot of the time when we're dealing with people selling data on you and we're dealing with people putting together these pictures, it's not necessarily one person doing it. It's maybe just an automated tool. It's the way of hacking, the way of gathering information these days is not necessarily about targeting an individual. It's about how much you can get by just letting a program run. And, you know, with with that Facebook breach, it, it blew my mind when it, it finally made news because I had been using it for years. And I don't know how many people do know about this or about that breach, but it was not new. It had been around. Like, that vulnerability was around for a long time. And you may have known this in this field, but there were a lot of tools and a lot of scrapers people were using to pull information with that hack just over and over and over again. And finally, somebody just said, you know what? We're going to pull all of it, and we're going to sell it. And that's what they did. So when you think of it that way, what services are you using now that may actually have a hack? And people are using it, and it's just not been made public yet right like there's an entire industry and an entire dark market industry of getting these hacks out there in a way that it's not broadly known so that you can get the most out of the time you have with it before it gets patched or before it gets fixed and when you're talking about how this was maybe i used it or maybe uh, someone just decided to turn it on there are entire frameworks on the internet that you can go in i encourage anyone listening to go to the OSINT framework website where some of it's a little out of date, but you can just kind of figure out where you want to start looking for someone and it will direct you to how to find it. Because as we said, with open source intelligence, all you're doing is taking what's mostly public knowledge and doing it legally to find 
a picture on someone. People don't realize how easy it is to find them, and all they had to do is buy a phone. You know, everybody, you, you, we wish in the in the industry of skip tracing that man. Why don't people just carry tracking devices? And I said one day, I said, well, they do. They're addicted to their tracking devices, and nobody's told them it's a tracking device, and it's just their phone. It's gonna be in my pocket when I go up to the store. It's gonna be probably playing music when I drive to work in the morning. You know, it's not inherently a bad thing. There are plenty of reasons to have this as ingrained into our lives as we do. But as with most things, even if there are the good benefits to it, someone's going to figure out how to sell it. Someone's going to figure out how to make a profit. It's the inherent capitalism of anything that's in our society these days. For any so anyone who might want to learn how to do this, where would you recommend they start? If there's all these... Uh, you know, not quite reputable sources. You had mentioned the book earlier on this uh, discussion, but are there any other uh, sources that you think you may want to plug out right now? Uh, well, if you're willing to pay the money, Michael Basil has a great course, um, but it, it's it's a hefty fee if you want to take the course. But I mean, it's a lifetime membership and you get tons of content from it. Um, but as far as just learning or a course, I didn't take any specific course myself, so I really can't plug anything but um after i had really gotten good at it i did i guess look into a few udemy courses but it's a lot of just basic stuff so there's some stuff out there on like udemy um but it's it's very basic and it doesn't go into the methodology very much so i guess for learning wise you'd want to just kind of i hate to say this but just do it just get your feet wet with it and just try it out and eventually you'll just kind of pick it up uh there's a book actually i'm holding it right now by michael basil uh it's open source intelligence techniques and it is a it's a great book and there's another book by no starch press about web scraping uh, social media sites to create news stories. I can't remember the name of it, um, but it teaches you how to program in Python and do a lot of web scraping to pull a lot of OSINT information. So those are some great resources to, I guess, pick up and learn. But as far as learning methodology, it's just something you're going to have. It's a mindset you're going to have to either teach yourself or be born with. I mean, as with all things, I think in these fields, it all stems from curiosity and I said this in the last episode, there is a saying in IT, in information security, I'm sure in OSINT especially, Google is your friend. Just keep doing it, right? Maybe just see where you can find, you said Crime Stoppers, right? Can anyone do Crime Stoppers? Is it public yeah. available or is it specifically contracted out? No, it's public information. So it's it's like uh, people go missing or, um, you know, somebody skips out on bond and is wanted for murder or, you know, attempted murder or drug dealing or anything like that. They Their picture from their arrest is up on Crime Stoppers with every piece of information that they've put out there. And you can just quickly pull all that information and, you know, run your own research on it. Uh, I'll create tons of sock accounts, sock puppet accounts, and just, you know, follow them and stalk them. For weeks, if the reward is high enough, I'll even stalk them for months and just wait on them to just pop one little piece of information. I'll wait on them to mess up one time. And once they've messed up, I'll submit my anonymous tip and the contact information I'll give them in order to send me a paycheck. And that's that's how it goes. Anyone can do it. And at the same time, you're kind of cleaning up the world. You're doing the world a favor. And I don't go after people that are like something simple, you know, like a speeding ticket. Like they can sort that out on their own. But if it's high value targets, then yeah, I'm definitely going to be after them. And I'm going to be sitting in the corner watching them until they mess up. And to really highlight your point of anybody can do this, I'm not sure if you've seen this, but it was big a year or two ago, the Netflix documentary, Don't Fuck With Cats. I've been wanting to watch it and I still haven't gotten around to watch it. So it really, I've only caught the bits and pieces of it. Uh, the idea basically was they were tracking this guy who was killing cats online he was killing pets online and it's a whole documentary that kind of hits on open source intelligence and how they used it to find this guy they would look at where he was doing it what he was doing it's kind of like this weird international mystery tracked down in the same way that you would use to track down a person these are all i believe you know just middle-aged women mostly who did not like what this guy was doing they uh, he was posting it online not a lot of experience in the field, but they banded together and combined their resources, and they found him. They got this internet cat killer, and now you can go in and take a look at that show. I'd recommend it. 
that, that sounds very interesting. And, you know, it's not a really big learning curve when you come into this. You, like you said, they kind of all came together and just figured it out and they didn't have any prior experience. That's really how it is. You, it, all you really have to have beforehand is you know a device and and you can do it with tons of different devices you don't have to have any specific device to do it in um and just an investigative mindset you just have to look at it like this is not the whole picture and i know the 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 answers to my questions are here how do i connect the dots with this kind of framework putting those dots together really making sure you've got the back end research done and suddenly you're either reporting someone who is you know, potentially a felon, or on the flip side of it, someone is finding who you are and really getting a clear picture into what your life is like, whether or not you know it. So Tank, that kind of brings me to the end of the interview questions that I had. I wanted to give you a moment, though, to plug anything you're working on. I do know you are working on your own open source intelligence framework website that's kind of based around U.S. specific open source intelligence. So if you want to talk a little bit about that in your podcast, I figured I'd give you a few minutes to just discuss what you've got going on before we head out. Yeah, so um, I created a site recently, and, you know, I'm still adding a lot of stuff to it, but it, it is up now. It's called usosint.com, and that's U-S-O-S-I-N-T.com. Um, and essentially, you know, I just take a lot of tools that I use day to day, and I write them down or put them in a spreadsheet, and then at the end of the day, I try to get that ready to put on the site. And uh, it's just stuff that's primarily U.S.-based resources for anybody that's coming from the U.K. or any other country or trying to do some research on someone here that doesn't know much about how our public record systems work or what are some tools they can use. So they can just hop on there and then find t tons of lists of resources to look into people. That sounds amazing. I've checked out what you've been posting online on it, and I've already bookmarked the site for my own resources it's incredible to see the kind of work that you're putting into this. And do you have anything interesting coming up after your privacy series on your podcast? Uh, no, nothing too interesting yet. Um, I might be uh, trying to put another course up, and I'm also going to be trying to hopefully get an interview with somebody. I'm not going to say who, though, because if it doesn't happen, I don't want anybody to, you know, have it spoiled for them. I definitely do want to go into covering you know, some of the, the recent doxing of certain celebrities. I've thought about doing that for a little while now, and every time a celebrity gets doxed, I see, oh, man, well, they could have cleaned up their privacy life right here, and they didn't. So just kind of going into it and talking about that. Yeah, I feel like between things that have come up recently, like the Twitch hack is a big example of private information being put out there and technical information. I feel like if you follow any major outlet, you can find two or three different niche celebrities. And when I say niche celebrities, I mean like you might find a video game influencer, you might find a makeup influencer, you might find someone who just has a hobby and suddenly their entire life is out there because someone has found where they live or has managed to find out their phone number. And people say, well, I don't have anything to hide. Well, what if one day you do? And because you didn't think about it now, in the future, you're putting yourself or the people you love in danger. Right. And it's something that even like, God, I don't want to sound egotistical, but if my show or if our show ends up getting up higher, it's something to consider, right? Like a year ago, I wouldn't have considered I have something to hide. But if I keep putting the show out and people keep listening, eventually I might want to take a step back and I'm kind of operating on the fact that like if I'm just open enough to give people a glimpse into my life that they won't go looking deeper but you can't always make that case it's probably going to be something that I will have to pay a little more attention to in the future yeah and, and you have to think what if you brought like so what if you 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 pissed somebody off and you didn't know you pissed them off you never knew it at all but now you have that person that you don't even know about who's been watching you for a long time and just waiting on you to mess up so they can strike and that I, I see that all the time at work i hear about that stuff happening and it, it's sad but I, I have to say, you know, well, if they would have taken it more seriously earlier on, they wouldn't be in that situation. Exactly. I feel like one of my first points is kind of who you were versus who you are. There's going to be a lot of stuff from who you were always out there. So maybe next time consider who you're going to be 
as you're posting, right? Who you are right now is going to end up being who you were in the future. And you're going to want to take that into consideration a little bit when you're clicking maybe allow all permissions for a random application on your phone. And that's another thing I got my brother to finally start doing. And he checked all the apps on his phone and he was like, bro, why didn't you tell me this years ago? Like, I didn't know that it needed this kind of service. I didn't know, you know, it needed this or I didn't know Snapchat held this. And like, that, that's something else I'd even like to mention while I'm on here. Um, Snapchat is not a private messenger. There are two parts in Snapchat, two sets of data you can pull when you go to pull your data. One of them is all your messages and one of them is every picture. No matter if it's been deleted, archived, it's still there sitting in a zip file for you to download. So if you're looking into getting a little more private with this, um, don't opt for Snapchat to be your private messenger. It's not private. We're talking private messenger. I know you've talked about it before. I use Signal. You use, I think, either a combination of Signal or Session. These are encrypted texting tools that you can put on your phone. And while things like Apple do tout that they have end-to-end encryption on their devices, this is slightly a step back and meant to be a more privacy-focused messenger, something that is not necessarily having all your information being gathered on you while also providing a profile, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's like you said with Apple, like, yeah, it's encrypted, but encrypted by Apple, who has the keys. So is it really safe or are they just telling you, oh, well, it's safe for anybody that could try to snoop in between you, but we can see it. And that brings us to the end of this discussion. Thank you, Tank, for taking the time here. You can listen to his show, Cyber Sector 7, on all major podcast platforms, including that privacy-focused series we've talked about this episode. You can also follow me on Instagram at CyberSector7. Thanks for listening to this special out-of-band episode of What Michelle. I'm excited to start getting the chance to interview people in the industry more often and tell you more amazing stories. You can follow me at shell underscore pod on Instagram to keep up to date with the latest show news. Or if you're interested in collaborating, or maybe you just have a question, you can always shoot me a DM there or email me at shellpod at protonmail.com. I'm John Cordes, and that was Tank from Cyber Sector 7. And thanks for listening to us explain what the shell a skip tracer does and why privacy really does matter. <laughs>